Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the new Mama Marriage Bliss show. I don't know if you realize, but usually I release my episodes on Tuesdays. And this week, I am releasing it one day late. And I wanted to share that with you because I wanted to say that I know what it's like to decide that you want something to happen in a certain way and then have to be really attuned to what's going on around you and be able to have grace with yourself to say, okay, maybe things aren't going to happen exactly the way I planned. And I'm going to be okay with that and be okay with myself for that. So that's what happened to me. I was really all planned on, you know, releasing my episode on Tuesday, just like I always do. And then some really tough things started happening in our home. And I knew that the best thing for my family was to have that grace with myself and with my family and to be able to say that it's okay if things change. So I want to just shout that out, give you permission to have grace with yourself and with your family and let things happen not as planned. That's okay. So after that nice introduction, I want to start off with a joke. There were these three elderly women that were sitting around and talking together, and they each wanted to boast about how their sons loved them the most. So the first one says, my son loves me so much that he bought me a house. The second one says, no, my son loves me so much more. He bought me tickets to this unbelievable cruise that I go on every year. And then the third one says, no, no, my son loves me the most because he pays a lot of money every week to talk just about me. (laughs) So jokes aside, we all have things that we probably could use a little therapy about. We all have things that we would like to take from the way we were brought up or from the things that society has taught us. And there are things that we really want to break out of. And in today's episode, I get to speak to Laura Linklater, who is an awesome human being, and she is also a cycle breaker parent mentor. She helps parents who had a tough upbringing and are committed to being the gentle, empowering parent they always dreamed that they would be. Laura is on a mission to support and guide conscious parents as they heal and learn practical skills so that they can in turn support their children's emotional and behavioral development. Laura helps you to identify and honor your triggers for reactions in ways you don't wish to act in your role as a parent, shouting, anger, shaming, withdrawing, and to make sense of your past experiences and to find peace as you embark on a journey of self-healing. She also helps you to understand your child's behavior and teaches you practical parenting, listening and conflict resolution skills you need so that you can raise up your children and break the cycles you do not wish to pass on. Laura helps parents to break their cycles so that they can support their children to flourish and build a connected, loving family. Healing plus skills equals the parent you always wanted to be. In this episode, we start off by hearing about Laura's journey, and then we go on to really talking about what it means to be a cycle-breaking parent. Enjoy the episode. Feel free to reach out either to me or to Laura if you feel like you need some support in this area of breaking out of cycles that you wish to set yourself free from. So you can find me or Laura um, in all the links that are in the show notes. Please feel free to reach out and DM me and I am happy to be there in whatever way possible to help you on this journey. Enjoy the episode. Hey and welcome to the new Mama Marriage Bliss Show. I want to help you get out of the overwhelming distance and guide you to reconnect to yourself and to your husband. You know you want things to be different, but you're probably not sure how to make it happen. Well, Mama, you're in the right place. Here we will dive into all the things you need to start loving your life and relationship and start living like soulmates and not roommates anymore. We will dive into motherhood, marriage, communication, holistic inspiration, 
and practical hacks and tips. Mama, I believe that transformation and deep connection await you. Hi, I'm Aliza Saeed, proud mama and grateful wife, and the Mama Marriage Coach. You too can turn your mess into magic. Come on, mama, and let's do it together. Hi, Laura, and welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited you're here, especially since this is a topic that is very close to my heart. And I would just love to hear and tell our listeners who you are, where you're from, and what you do. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I'm so honored, and I'm so excited it happened. <laughs> it's, been, it's just been great getting to know you as well. Um, yeah, so I am a cycle breaker parenting mentor, which sounds like a bit of a mouthful, but it does what it says on the tip, and it is exactly that. So I work with, I mentor and coach. I often use the term mentor because I feel I walk I walk side by side like I don't stand on the sidelines going yeah you can do it this is what you do like we walk the path together it's quite high touch when when I like to work with people so I mentor parents to break cycles and that means uh, quite a lot of different things but essentially most of the the people I work with have tough upbringings so we we talk a lot about things like the adverse childhood experiences model which is the you know the the kind of formal way but essentially it just means people who've had a tough upbringing and they know, you know, for whatever reason, and they know that they want to parent differently. So when they're thinking about the future, or like for me, it happened because I'm a cycle breaker parent myself. It was when I was pregnant and I had this moment where like this moment of clarity, you know, it doesn't really sink in until the baby arrives. <laughs> Even then you're still like, oh my goodness, <laughs> it's real. But I did have that moment where I was like, I will make sure that you never feel you know the way that I felt and there was that really clear moment where I think some part of me inside committed to I'm breaking the cycle it stops with me and so I work with the parents who say essentially that and so they might have had very very tough upbringings like I I talk quite freely about my story because it's helpful for so many others uh one of my parents was a functional alcoholic who was sometimes when he was in a good place See, this is the, the wisdom of being able of having done a lot of healing. When he was in a good place, he could be a very brilliant dad or as much as he could be. And when he wasn't, he was quite scary. And when he was inebriated, he was terrifying. And, and then we would, I'm the baby of five kids as well. And so, you know, we, we grew up in this very confusing, oh, and our, our mum was often caught between being the mum that she wanted to be and also protecting us and she wasn't treated particularly well so we saw things that we shouldn't have and and it, it's that realization that okay when you know when I had my first I was pregnant with my first child and I was like no I'm not I'm not perpetuating that it stops with me how do I do that <laughs> and then we went on this whole path and I know we will probably talk about it like bits of my previous career had gone in not me so I work with cycle breaker parents because they're awesome <laughs> to be that person who stands up and says okay no it stops with me is quite a powerful statement I think powerful and so brave tell us about your past career because it's pretty amazing <laughs> quite colorful isn't it yeah so I was just telling yeah <laughs> so it, it all starts <laughs> it started well I mean I, I worked from a, a very young age anyway so I, was, I didn't even I was a lifeguard I was a trainee swimming teacher I did all these kind of things to put myself through university and I I worked I volunteered initially I lived in Damascus in Syria this is years ago before when it was a simply calm place to be it was in about 2007 2008 and my my degree I studied Arabic and Persian so I was over there and I was just honored and so lucky to work in refugee camps uh, with just people from everywhere so I was able to support them and I, and you know at 19 <laughs> it's such an eye-opener like you just you see these things on the tv and you read about them in the newspaper and it's just like what it's really like and I would always end up so when you go in they say okay so we've got you know the soup kitchen stuff we've got like sewing things we've got helping and I was always with the kids always with the kids and always with the moms and and I think I didn't realize to work with moms and dads and families and you know give them a break and some respite and just play just play and so then I came back to the UK where I was at the university it was joint it was University of London University that was a very cool period of life 
but it wasn't it wasn't set to last uh, because what I had a kind of that deeper calling and I went to work as a, a support staff member so not a police officer but a supporting staff member with uh, young offenders and it was uh, not just you know, so young offenders is quite a big term which is in some ways a bit meaningless you know it's basically kids who have gone off the you know off the track and are struggling and we have different support platforms for them and I worked with young people who were at risk of being groomed or actively we knew they were being groomed by extremist organizations and this is the really well I'm smiling because it was a really challenging job which you can imagine so many emotions so much stuff that it was young people all the way you know from like eight years old all the way up to 18 just shouldn't have been shown and I was able to support them but it was really interesting that they were from these different backgrounds so there was you know religious extremism there was far right there was white supremacists there was all kinds of of different groups targeting young people and they were all using the same mechanisms all of it it was children who had not very good literacy, not very good numeracy by and large, and uh, didn't have very much self-esteem. Often they had complicated homes with the adverse childhood experiences and uh, and they trusted adults and those adults abused their, that, you know, that bond to get them to do things. The really incredible thing that I was able to see from, you know, from the outside looking in was that no matter what, I mean, effectively, it's the mechanism of hate. <laughs> like, no matter what the mechanism of the hate or the background or the ideology was, it was the same, the same strategies that they were using to groom these children and young people. So it was taking advantage of the fact that they had usually, not exclusively, but usually not very great literacy, usually not very great numeracy skills. Uh, often it was children and young people of complicated homes so they didn't have very high self-esteem and they were looking for validation from outside and uh, and and often they they wanted to be away from their homes so you know these adults had access to them and also they didn't question authority that was a really really big thing so what I ended up doing was I worked there for um for a year and it was it was incredible and eye-opening and in that time we had the children and young people come in and we helped them and then they went back out and you know because of the nature of it's a very complicated situation as I think many many of us know and they would come back <laughs> and they would come back into the front door again or I get a phone call where somebody would say ah, I've got one of your kids can you come and get him or can you come and get her and and we would start the whole process again so we we were going around in cycles more and more cycles and then we do our thing and off they would go and we think that we've broken it three months later back and through the door or I'd be called to a you know to an incident and ah it would be this child or this young person and so I I actually changed I retrained as a primary school teacher and and the, the logic was and also I do love learning and I'm quite a maths geek anyway but the the logic was if I could work with a yes a smaller group of children so it would be you know like 30 or 32 young very young children uh, say up to up to 11 at the most uh, so if I could work with a small group I could help them with the functional literacy the functional numeracy with their self-esteem because a, a class teacher has so much power to do good and opportunity to do good in that scenario so I was working with these uh, with these children and young people and actually it was great it was great I mean I actually home educate my own children so in terms of the uh, in terms of the education system there are a lot of things that I would change and I think it's great for a lot of people and we just we chose to opt out of it so I then I then had my babies so I had one baby and I had another baby (laughs) and then the next year I had another baby so I had uh, three under three and a half and going back to work wasn't it just wasn't an option (laughs) for me and um, and I didn't want to go back into class teaching and we knew very early my husband and I knew that we were going to be going down the home education and world schooling route this was our plan and so it didn't make sense to you know I just effectively I just quit <laughs> and and so I became a stay-at-home mom for uh what five and a half wonderful wonderful years of being you know just me and my babies it was beautiful and then uh fast forward we came to about it was the end of 2019 and I was in you know I was going to all the mummy groups and getting to know lots of people so whereas I hadn't had many friends who were parents I was at age you know a lot of my friends were having kids and you know so were the people that I was meeting socially 
And because they knew my background, I would always be asked questions, you know, how can you do this? How can you do this? And I would talk about my upbringing and my my complicated upbringing. I parented differently to a lot of mainstream parenting and uh, and that raised a few eyebrows, you know, like we don't use punishments and I don't raise my voice. Well, I try not to raise my voice. We're all human, aren't we? And, um, and I would give my children, even, you know, when they were, you know, two, three, four, I mean, they're, <laughs> they're still quite young. My youngest is only three now. Uh, I would give them so much leeway and respect and responsibility and people would be saying oh no he can't do that oh no she can't do that and then they would watch as they made their own toast or you know they got themselves dressed and it took a long time and you know that kind of thing and uh things like the naughty step that we didn't do it and mum you know some of the mums were talking about it and I said well you know we're just doing something different this is what we're doing and I I just realized and my husband realized it first as is the way somebody else points it out a lot of people were asking me advice and the reasons for that advice and I would be telling them the theory and you know my learning and child development and I was <laughs> because because I'm me and I, I can't sit still I was doing my master's in education and child development whilst I was pregnant with number two <laughs> so he arrived just after I did my dissertation and and you know so I was full of all these theories and then COVID hit <laughs> and and you know a lot of the mums and dads that I was in that social group with were like we can't do this how do we do this you you know you home educate your children and you know we're all homeschooling and there's anxiety and we don't know what to do and another one of my home ed friends essentially she sort of I guess she gave me the push she gave me the push that I needed to to take it further because she said look 15 people came to you in one week for you know, advice and help and support and skills and I was creating things like creating pdfs <laughs> and making recordings of myself for them and she was like just just do it you're already here you're on the verge of it you said that you're about ready to go back into the world of paid work you know now the children are a bit older just do it and so on January the 1st oh, January the 1st 2020 I opened my mentoring service and I had my first client on January the 3rd <laughs> and sort of did a bit of a and you know, it's just kept going from there so I, I work one or two days a week so because I, I home educate my children and we travel around Vietnam and hopefully Cambodia soon and and so it it fits in with our world schooling life and the ethos and I I get to oh it's just the biggest honor ever you know I get to spend usually I block Fridays I get to spend Fridays with clients supporting families and helping them to break the cycles that they grew up in and become that gentle parent that they want that they always wanted to be and a lot of people say to me when we first meet and it was something that I definitely recognized from when I was pregnant with number one and number two and number three and just saying I never want my baby to feel like I felt when I was five I never want my kid to feel that fear I never want them to feel confused or nervous or to ask does my mommy love me does my daddy love me am I safe and I hear that from so many people and I'm able to put together all of that stuff that I've done in my past and on myself as well because I'm constantly working on myself and and to help other people to do the same and break their cycles and it's just it's just wonderful magical wow sounds like you're living the dream <laughs> long career <laughs> wow that's amazing so cool. as I hear you talking about breaking the cycles it sounds like you need a lot of bravery to be able to do it and be able a lot of inside inner power to be able to stand up and do it I think let's divide it for a second of there's you know people that grow up in really <laughs> hard situations and have a really difficult upbringing and there, I think the cycles are much clearer of what cycles they want to break. What are the things that they don't want to continue into their children's, you know, like what those cycles are. And then there's... Yeah. It's people, kind of, it's quite clear cut, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But then there are some people that they grow up in a loving family. And even in those families, there are cycles that they want to break, right? So maybe, could you talk about what are the cycles that you see with your clients that most of them are trying to escape from? Yeah, it's funny you say that because another one of the things that I, you know, you start to notice trends when you when you speak to people, and a lot of people will say, "Hey, look, so I have I have small children right now, and you know I'm doing this thing, and I know that I 
I didn't have a really tough upbringing. You know, I had a, a relatively lovely upbringing and, and I know my parents tried their best, but, but <laughs> I didn't always feel safe or, or I didn't feel safety mean to express myself, but I often slipped into people pleasing because, you know, I just didn't want to disappoint them or, but I mean, I had one client once and, and it completed as one in, in the early days, <laughs> you know, the early days, it's only two years. And, and she, um, and she said, so she was in her mid forties. She actually had teenage kids, like no mid late forties. And she, yeah. And, and she said, I never wanted to do the job I'm in. And now that we've worked together, I, I just, I know that I went into this job because my dad was so disapproving about my dreams and she changed her career and became a midwife. <laughs> so, wow. And that was, that was as a result of parenting coaching because, yeah. because parenting coaching is about us. It's actually about us finding ourselves. Why so I always talk about healing plus the skills. You know, the skills on their own will get you so far. Skills are useful and they, they do help. And I do teach skills, but it, it's the healing that enables us to, to be who we really want to be. And that's how we become the parent that we want to be. So, and actually, I, that is one of the first things that we, we talk about. So it doesn't matter whether you've had, you know, a really awful upbringing. You know, often people think, and there's that word trauma, and people shy away from that because to say I have trauma in my upbringing is 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 kind of upsetting it's upsetting to acknowledge and sometimes people have this it's almost like not shame about having it but that you know that whole thing of but other people had it worse than me you know I know people who were beaten when they were children you have a and people say this you know you have an alcoholic parent I didn't I just didn't feel like I could really express myself and it's still valid. This is the thing I try and tell everyone. It's, it's still valid because if it is still upsetting you now as an adult, and if you're seeing it and thinking, I don't want this for my children, you absolutely have the right to heal. You absolutely have the right to access the support that you need. And I guess that's the one thing is trauma isn't, it isn't a Marvel story. You know, it isn't how you become Spider-Man. It is, in one sense, that is definitely clear-cut trauma, like you said. But but also we have all these mini, you know, lowercase t. I mean, sometimes do that capital T and lowercase t. It's still, if it's holding you back, if you're remembering it, if it's still making you feel a bit wobbly now in your heart, and then you get to break it. And really where we start is is by facing it and just saying okay well you know maybe there is something there that's the first bit maybe there is something there and and being curious and then we get to go a bit further so it's all about going uh, like a little bit further why why what is it about that well I know that I wasn't allowed to express myself like that as a child or I mean I was very I hate that I don't know the term tomboyish and actually I wasn't I was just really really active and I have a have a daughter who climbs trees and you know she's really into archery and she does fencing as her sport that's her favorite sport and when I was a, a child it was a re- it was a thing that we talked about in that oh she's different you know she likes to climb trees and and I don't want that for my children and so we can stop there and say okay I don't want that for my children and we can use some skills and, and re- but then we can also go deeper why what was it about that that made me feel not good enough you just keep going a little bit deeper and I often talk about it being that compassionate curiosity there's no judgment there so why or you know sometimes we do things another really good clue it's not quite so fun another really good clue is when we say something or we do something and then we feel icky afterwards yeah I have three children they're three under seven well she's just and seven now so seven and under and you know sometimes I raise my voice and I don't feel great when I do it and there's always a reason so for me at this point I can say oh, I raise my voice at my children so I apologize you, you know we talk about the rupture and repair model you're going to have ruptures we're going to fall out sometimes we're going to be grumpy with each other sometimes we're tired as parents <laughs> you see you're literally cradling a newborn sometimes we're tired <laughs> <laughs> and and that's okay you know we can't always be our best selves but another like a way a really great way of starting with the cycle breaking is just to tune in so say I raise my voice at my children okay I feel icky about it why because it's not how I want to be when I show up with my family why because I know what it feels like to be shouted at and I didn't like it and it made me feel unsafe and I want my children to feel safe okay and then this is you know we can't change everything in one in one day 
but it makes it a little bit a little bit easier just to see why do I want to change this and when we have the motivation yes you we can seek support and sometimes we can do it on our own but when we have that motivation and that commitment that is when things change because we stop seeing our children as as things that we manage and things that stress us out and we start seeing them as oh this is a little human being just like I was a little human being and this is how they probably want to be treated they probably don't want to be shouted at when they spill something they probably want to be supported just like I did when I was a child and then you know and then actually the cycle breaking actions they flow because we're, we're looking at it like that so yeah so I'm hearing <laughs> yeah. you say that the first step of breaking out of a cycle is to just be really aware of it to learn to yeah to, to you know have that awareness and then ask yourself why why why, why? and why? dig <laughs> deep with that and, yeah, and, then and sometimes it would, that does take bravery yeah that, sometimes it's upsetting and you realize oh actually you know that this this okay upbringing that I had some elements of it weren't that okay and it, it wasn't okay that my mom would shout at me really loudly if I did something that she didn't like it wasn't okay and then we have to look at it you know so it's actually much easier you know when we talk about conscious parenting it's much easier and safer in a way to repeat the cycles because we don't want to be conscious we don't want to look at it why would way it's upsetting and that's you know you said it is brave and it is powerful and that's why so that's why I wanted to support people because it's hard to do that without support and and love and somebody in your corner and that might be your partner your co-parent your best friend and it might not be because they might not be around or people might not understand you know you doing things differently that's a different challenge in itself I think yeah I you said you know you might not want to be aware of it and I once had a conversation with my friend and she said, OK, there were things I didn't like about how I was brought up, but my parents were so loving and I can't co- I can't complain about anything. And, they, you know, they did their best. And I think that when we divide the person and the actions, when I'm saying there was something that wasn't great for me yeah. when I when I grew up, it's not saying I'm angry at my parents or they did something wrong. They tried to do their best. And, you know, they maybe what they yeah. did was out of complete love. And being able to separate the actions from the person doesn't mean that I'm, you know, resentful to my parents. I might be completely yeah. understanding to, you know, their situation or they didn't know any better or that's how they were brought up and they weren't able to be a cycle breaker parent. And then it might give us a little bit more permission to actually admit, you know, yeah. what I'm feeling. People often resist. Yeah, that reparenting, the reparenting work and that, that action and and going through that process yet yeah, people often kind of bulk a little bit at that idea of, of you know going back and can you give yourself you know when we talk about inner child work and inner child healing you know what did you need then and how can you give that to yourself now like I mean I do lots of watercolors now and I'm not terribly good but I like it because in our household it was very much you uh you do because we we grew up not with a lot of money so all of our education was geared towards and you have to get a good job and you have to get a good job and you have to be secure. And of course, I can see that reflecting on it as my mom, who was trying to protect us, particularly the, the, the daughters, she was trying to protect us. And doesn't it make sense if she grew, she was in that relationship. It makes perfect sense that she was saying to, to me and my sister, you know, I want you to be able to stand on your own two feet. I want you never to be beholden to a man. You know, and soon <laughs> me and my sister have had to work through this in our relationships. And, you know, it wasn't great because we then started our relationships like I have to have my own bank account. Well, I have my own bank account. But, you know, I have to be completely separate to you because I can't rely on men. And this is this is about cycle breaking in marital relationships. That, and, and where did that come from? It came from my mom protecting me in the way that she knew how and like you said we can we can split this off of for me to say actually that particular you know that message about uh you know marriage and relationships and being beholden to a man is you know in in our house uh that (coughs) that that's that's not serving me it wasn't serving me in my relationship now like you said that was my mom doing her best and I can say to my mom in my reparenting work as I move forward because you'll know that when we sort of when we work on this area of parenting, it, it's all of us because 
as parents, we are a holistic human being. You know, we have all of our hurts from the past. We have all of our joys. We have our physical body health and we have our energy. All of it comes together. So we could say, thank you for trying to protect me. Thank you for doing the best that you could do. And actually what she taught my sister and I, it did serve us for a while because it, it, you know, we came out with some great qualifications and great experience and we hit our early 20s able to support ourselves. And then we found partners, and which was great. And, and then there was a point where I was like, this isn't serving me now. And so we can go back and do that. And it's not disrespectful. Often people worry when they're doing the reparenting work and saying this thing didn't serve me. Uh, I'm going to go back and do some healing. They think, oh, but, but isn't that disrespectful to my mom? Is that saying I don't love my mom? Is that a rejection of my mom? And it's not. It's not at all. And, you know, my mom doesn't know. She doesn't know. She doesn't care. It's not hurting her. But it actually has changed my, I know I'm going off into relationships, but it's all interlinked, isn't it? Relationships and family and stories and subconscious and, and the things that we tell ourselves to keep ourselves safe. It has hugely benefited my relationship to be able to let go a bit of that and to lean on another person. And it's also benefited my parenting relationship and co-parenting relationship with my husband because I can actually cede some control around the household, which was one of my um, it was one of my areas that I worked on when I had you know my three babies. I was at home and I kept them very very close together. And you know, poor John would you know come in at the weekend and I'd be like, no no no, we don't do it like that. <laughs> and and I'd had to I'd had to unpick that, and I couldn't unpick that by brute force alone, by skills alone. It, it took. Why do I need to control? Ah, uh, why do I not trust? And once I gone into that and done, it effectively it was reparenting work. It said, thank you for this story. Thank you for doing your best. I'm actually going to rewrite that and I'm going to take something different forward with me. That is how the cycle is broken. Said that um, that it's not disrespectful. And I think that also, you know, just understanding that my children will also probably have to break out of some cycles that I'm creating. And it yeah, doesn't mean yeah. that I'm a bad person or that I'm trying to do anything bad. It means that I, I kind of feel like each generation is, you know, refining and fixing more things and more things until mm -hmm. we get to become a better world. I remember my father always saying when we were growing up, look, this is the way I'm doing it. When you have kids, you're going to do it even better. <laughs> remember all the things that I'm doing that you don't like. <laughs> remember to fix it and now when I have kids I find myself a lot of times doing the same things that I was upset about oh yeah it's I so remember funny. Him saying, when you hear them come out of your mouth <laughs> absolutely and then I remember him saying like do it how you want fix it and I respect him for recognizing that we're all going to fix those yeah. cycles which is also I think one of the things as well is that we can give our children the skills to do that like I often talk about and it sounds so small but it's also quite well maybe it's not so big it's it's a small thing but it had a big impact there we go things like spilling like in my house so we have five kids imagine like me is like little laura five kids you know all running around all over the place and uh one of them is autistic because my older brother was well i'm younger so he's number four out of five is autistic you know like this house is busy and noisy and we had my dad who was some you know inconsistent some good days some not good days and um if you spilled something you know like glass on the floor it was bad. Like my mom, because my mom would be like, no, no. And maybe she had her own things from her upbringing, but it meant that we were always very nervous about spilling things. And um, I'm quite clumsy. <laughs> so, and this is just who I am. And um, and so when, when I then had children, you know, I was thinking about the big things about fear and safety and all this. You know, I had children and my children, well, there was this one day when my, I think it was my, actually it was one of my boys had spilled something. And I, and I had just done this, huge reaction this is where we say like the conscious and compassionate curiosity like why did I have such a big reaction to this so I had this like huge like oh come on and then gone to get a cloth and been you know the martyr like I'm picking it up and then my daughter that evening we were reading a book and uh the dad in the book had not put the lid on the blender and it had gone everywhere and the mom had come in and said no first clean it up and my daughter you know it's like an early reader book and my daughter said I wish that you were like that because it's really scary when you shout. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, the pout, because it hurts. It really, you could, obviously people can't see, but I'm teared up already because it hurt to hear that. And then when I reflected, I'm actually really proud that she knows that she can say, mom, you hurt me. 
and then I can do something about it. And, you know, I could have got really defensive. And inside, I was a bit like, mm, I'm trying my best. And I am trying my best. And I was trying my best. But it was that moment where something had happened. You know, we go back to the beginning. Why? Why did that happen? Where did that response come from? Why is it important to me not to do that? Well, because I know how it feels. And because I don't want my child to say and to feel, you know, to drop something and be like, "Uh oh, hide it, hide it. <laughs> I mean, I know they will do, but you know what I mean, without that big connotation of fear. And, uh, and that was a turning point. And it's something really small, spilling a drink. But it became a moment of, and so if we are able to, almost like we're starting the reparenting now, because my, she was then uh, five and a half, for a five and a half year old to be able to say to the authority figure, you know, the mom and the dad, you hurt me, please can we not do that? It, it really felt, you know, some, most of the day, we, you know, we're just getting through our days and, and, you know bumbling through together and occasionally we have moments where you sit back and go oh that that was a seismic that you know almost like you hear the chain breaking a little bit like oh we broke that there and then and then I build in if I ever do things that you don't like please tell me because I need to know and I don't always know because I'm just a human being and so we have this open relationship that hopefully you know as you said when they're older they go my mum tried her best she messed that up. <laughs> I'm going to go and find somebody in a heel and I'm going to not do that for my kids. You know, and, and like you said, they refine, they refine, they refine. And yeah. And that's in some ways it's really freeing because we don't have to be perfect. Right. We can't be perfect and we should stop trying to be it. And yeah. <laughs> I better. actually just had that kind <laughs> of like heart stabbing moment with also one of my children that, you know, it's something that you're trying to work so hard on and then they, pinpointed exactly and I feel like they have yeah. this ability to know exactly what your sensitive <laughs> parts are that you're trying to break out of and every time you fail they are going to point it out to you oh, and yeah. then you said compassion curiosity and there was a third thing what was that uh, was it just compassion goodness. curiosity I think compassionate curiosity compassionate yeah compassionate curiosity <laughs> so compassionate curiosity to yourself I think is such a great tool in those moments of like okay wait a minute and I Hold the defensiveness yeah. because that's what wants to come out at that moment because you're working so hard on it and you're trying so you're hard try and just use compassionate cu curiosity. Yeah, and we can honor it and say like, okay, I'm feeling really defensive about that because I am trying my best. And then later, you know, this is the thing where like we, we cannot process our feelings in real time in front of our children because we, they need it. It doesn't mean that we have to stuff down our feelings and completely repress them because that will just backfire later when they all come out in one go. But what we can do, and I do this quite often, is I will either say to my children, okay, mommy needs a moment. Mommy is a bit upset. And I have some uh, things like on Instagram. My husband sneakily filmed me once uh, where we'd had like a really tough interaction. And um, and I'd said to the kids, mommy's going to go. I, I use EFT tapping when I when I work with people and I've used it for myself. I use it with the kids, actually. And so I've basically gone to hide in the kitchen, put the kettle on. And whilst the kettle was, because I'm British, so we solve everything with a cup of tea, everything. <laughs> and I stood there and I was like tapping away and kind of mumbling to myself. And I have like I have certain things that I say. And usually it's something like I'm doing my best. I am enough. We can get through this. You know this. And I was just kind of tapping on all my, you know, the standard points of going through. And my kids are watching this. And what they're watching is not mummy's lost it. They're not, but, but they're not learning mummy is perfect and mummy can do everything. They are learning mummy is having a tough time right now because that was really stressful. Mummy is using a support mechanism. Mummy is using a tool to calm down. And then we'll go back and I'll say, okay, <laughs> right, can we just talk about that? And then we unpick what it is or, you know, we try and solve the problem. And then what happens, and mine, mine right now are seven, five, and three, and even my three-year-old, I have a, an, I also have an app where it, that's got lots of tapping, you know, that I pay for that, that, you know, you can search for like anxiety or money worries, or I've been doing a lot of like healing ones right now to help my body get in a really great state. And, um, and my youngest one, Teddy, come over and he was like, mommy, can I do the annoying brother one? <laughs> and he was like tapping like, my brother stole my toys. My brother is annoying. And he's like, you know, patting, you know, patting them in the wrong places. But, but he was, he basically said, I am feeling some feelings. Please help me process them. And he, of course he doesn't know that. And, and this is a gift that we're, we're giving them. So, that, you know, that whole thing about not being perfect, but what they, what they can learn is 
my mummy used some tools and then they can use those tools as well. And, and so narrating your, I'm having a tough time right now. I'm feeling quite frustrated or that was, uh, you know, that particular time when I was doing my tapping by the kettle. There have been a few, there are many. And, <laughs> and that, um, one of them was being really unsafe by the swimming pool. So we'd have to go home and they weren't very happy with me. And I said, well, this is, this is my boundary. We have to be safe by the pool or we can't go there until we're ready to be safe. And, um, and I said, I'm feeling really scared and the feelings of scared are in my body in this age appropriate honesty way the feelings of scared are in my body and I can't I can't talk to you yet in a calm way and I really want to and I don't want to shout so please may I have just five minutes and they were sort of like okay <laughs> and then I modeled it in front of them so it's really open like all of it is really really open and sometimes it's quite challenging to me because I never witnessed that I never saw my mom having coping mechanisms or, or certainly not my, well, I saw my dad having coping mechanisms, but they weren't adaptive because it was alcohol. But now I can show them there's a different way. And, and in itself, through my vulnerability, they don't not respect. I mean, I don't really know exactly what they think, but I'm hoping that, that they just learn. I don't have to be perfect all the time. I don't have to be in control of my emotions all the time. My emotions can be a clue to help me to navigate my life. And then they also have some ready-made, you know, tapping, however they do it. They don't do it right, but it's fine. <laughs> you know, or sometimes I'll punch a pillow, you know, that kind of thing. All of the emotional intelligence things that we can help our children with. So that, I, that was long. That. I, talk, I talk about mommy timeout a lot, but sometimes mommy needs a little bit of a timeout. And I also <laughs> close the door, put on a good meditation or whatever. And I feel like that is the perfect, imperfect modeling that we can model to our kids. As you said, it's so empowering and it will create children who know how to cope in hard situations. And yeah, yes, fingers crossed. Exactly. So why don't we? Yeah, well, and also they know that they can undo it. <laughs> they right. know that in the future, they do it differently. Right. <laughs> and that we won't be offended. Yeah. Um, so we spoke a lot about the relationship with our children and in a parenting relationship. But let's go a little bit to our marital relationship or our romantic relationship, because, you know, studies show that children who come from divorced families, the percentages of them getting the, the statistics of them getting divorced is very, very high. So obviously there are definitely imitations of cycles that they've seen in their family. How do you break out or even how do you identify? Because sometimes people have a really hard time identifying that they're copying a cycle in their own marriage. So how do you identify and then break out of that cycle in a marriage? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't happen in one go. <laughs> That's it, doesn't that, it, it doesn't happen in one go. You know, I often say things like cycle breaking doesn't come with a fanfare. You know, we do have these moments, you know, like my, you know, my woman, my child saying, I wish you were like the one in the book. Yet we have our moments, but mostly it happens in very small things. So expectations, you you can't even once you identify it like you can't just go like okay I'm not gonna I'm not gonna believe that anymore <laughs> it doesn't work like that unfortunately but in some ways knowing that it is a slow long-term path is really useful because I'm not a, a psychologist I'm a coach for a reason because I want to be and uh, but essentially what we're doing you know when we're breaking cycles we are rewiring pathways. And if you think, you know, like the, you know, there's that common path that everybody goes. And then there's sometimes that, or like the beaten, like off the beaten track, like a mini path. And the more people walk it, and certainly in, our, in terms of our lives and our emotional lives and relationships, the more we walk the path, the more easy it is to see the path is there. And so we can, you know, we can build it up and build it up. And so when we, I guess when we're looking at the cycle, so that's once we've already identified it. But when we're, when we're looking or, you know, at that embryonic understanding of, oh, I'm repeating something, I guess it's, it, it's again, it's, it's the same thing with the parenting in a way. It's being aware. It's being, again, open and compassionate and curious and just noting when things feel wrong or when they're upsetting. Because a lot of the time, I mean, we, you know, we're two women, we're like talking right now especially women we are taught trained across cultures to swallow down our anger because anger is not acceptable anger is not a thing that we're allowed to show you know and and certainly I know that in my household it was probably part of being a female and being a, a female 
you know, raised in the 80s and 90s by a female who was, you know, a girl in the 50s, that, you know, there was that element. But also, if you have grown up in a tough upbringing and imagining that people who've grown up who have had divorce in their childhood, well, the chances are you saw some fights. <laughs> the chances are you saw some anger. The chances are you saw, or maybe you didn't see the explosive anger, but perhaps there was, you know, passive aggressive, you know, undercurrents. Like when you walk into a room and they've been having a fight and, and it's like, oh, oh, I don't want to be here. Uh oh, what do I do? What do I say? And we have that, you know, hyper vigilant approach of the children. Like, is mum in a good mood? Is dad in a good mood? Should I back away? And, and, and when we've had that, we might not, we, we possibly might have even just swallowed it down because you're not in that place as a child you're not safe no matter how otherwise lovely your upbringing is you are not safe to express fully how you feel because you may upset a parent and even after the divorce has happened and you may be living in two homes you may have you know single custody and see a parent but you're not necessarily many children say And this is just from me working in schools and with young offenders and, you know, seeing it. And also my parents divorced, which actually, to be honest, was a good thing. But we still went through that upheaval. We weren't always able to say, you know, mom, I feel really stressed out about this because we were worried about upsetting her. So we we kind of swallowed our feelings. Fast forward 30 years and I'm, you know, I'm getting married and we might not, as you say, we might not be consciously aware because, uh, our subconscious is is very clever and in some ways it's quite sneaky because all it does all it wants to do is to protect us so it hides things that upset us it's why you know you can see you can see patterns in other people's relationships so easily you can see them on tv you can see them in your friends you know other people at baby group you can't see it in yourself and because we are our you know inside our minds works really well to protect us from seeing things that are painful and the only way for us to see it is to tune in and that takes being conscious. It takes being a conscious parent. It takes being a conscious spouse. And and it, it takes taking that extra time to be brave and courageous. Ah, courageous, compassionate curiosity. There it is. <laughs> the three things. I'm going to write that down today because uh, it's very <laughs> that because you know say you have an argument or a fight or the same thing often a clue is the same thing happening because you know cycles clue in the name the same thing happening you know you think you've got it you had an argument or you, you know you dealt with it whether it's it's in a in a positive way or a less positive way anyway it's dealt with and then two months later same thing happens again you know he's late from work again and he promised he wouldn't be or you know you didn't show up and you didn't do this thing and he's cross with you or whatever and that is a time for us to say okay we have an option here the option is to be unconscious and just to be like, okay, I'm annoyed and go into, you know, coping strategies, perhaps pull ourselves further away to keep ourselves safe from having to deal with it. Or, or to take, yes, it is the tougher, like this is why the path of the cycle breaker is so powerful. And it's why I love devoting my career now to supporting cycle breakers. Because to say, this is really upsetting me. This is causing problems. I'm going to sit down and look at it. That's brave. But that's how change happens, because we will just repeat these cycles unconsciously again and again and again. So, so you know, this is this is really tough. And either and it depends. Everybody's marriage is so different, isn't it? But either can we please talk about this, which may or may not be something that you feel happy with doing, or uh, certainly because we have we you know we have three small children and we we both work. For for me, it would be can I please have Sunday morning to myself? Like, can you take them out? I'm just going to journal or I'm going to meditate, or I'm going to think, or I'm going to just have a cry because I'm just really stressed out about this, to actually process the feelings and then to get your, I mean, I'm a big journaler, to get the journal out, like, where does this come from? Why do I not like it? Why do I not like the fact, I mean, I'm using the exact, it actually isn't often like home from work, but <laughs> it actually works less and less, maybe because we've had those conversations and the boundaries, but to say, you know, husbands come home late from work and you know, miss putting the kids to bed and it's really annoyed me, it's really, really upset me. Why is it upsetting me? Because it's disrespectful because I work really hard in the home. Why is it important to me that he respects me? Because I never saw my mum being, and it's going to be a different answer for everyone, because I never saw my mum being respected or because I have a career too. And I want to, I want to explore that element of myself. And I can't in this role, in that kind of thing, that we get to go deeper and deeper into why is this upsetting me? Why is this important to me? And then I, 
you know, so there's that understanding and the understanding on its own is great. Nothing is going to change, though, <laughs> unless we do some things. So what would life be like if he came home earlier or worked less or if we had childcare for that period of time? So I didn't feel so exhausted on a Friday evening, you know, doing dinner, bath and bedtime on my own. What would that look like? Well, it would look like this. What would it look like if we do nothing? You know, and it becomes I often talk with with clients about that point where Facing it and taking the action is scary, but staying the same is so much worse that we're prompted to take the easier path. And that is a really great way of, of kind of tricking that, you know, that subconscious mechanism for safety of actually the safest thing to do here is to go through. <laughs> you know, that what's that book? Um, the Bear Hunt. You can't go over it. You can't go under yeah. it. Oh, no, we've got to go through it. And truly, most of these things, the only way to get through is to go through <laughs> And what is on the other side is so wonderful. It's magical. Uh, but it is it is tough. You know, there's that expectation. You're going to have a tough conversation. And when we sit and we just express ourselves, it's funny because I actually use a thing that I teach for parents to work with toddlers. <laughs> I use it in my marriage because it's so powerful. And we call it the, the collaborative problem solve, where you, you basically, you state, you put your cards on the table. I'm feeling like this. So I'm feeling like this. The reason is this. This is what I would like to happen. You know, I'm I'm feeling really, uh, I'm trying to think of that example I just used. I'm feeling really upset, but however you phrase that. I'm feeling really upset and uh, I'm feeling uh, devalued because you, again, for the fifth time this week, come home late and I've done the whole children routine and they've not seen you. And And the reason is, that it makes me feel that you don't respect me and my work and you know and my my work in the home this is just an example from something that would come up for us uh and uh and and also it's not a pattern you know that happened in my childhood and I always wanted I always hoped that we would be more equal together and when you actually put it out like that the chances are that the other person on the other side will say oh I didn't realize I didn't realize this is it. I'm not, my my husband does it to me as well. He does the talking technique on me because it's a powerful one. And I'll and I usually will go, Oh, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. What can we do? And then we, you know, so in the in the collaborative problem solve with the children, we say, you know, this is how mommy feels. I understand that, you know, you have a different agenda. You want to, you know, you want to play all night, fine. I'm just worried about you sleeping. And they say, Oh, but I want this. And you know, and then you hear them and you really, really hear them and listen to their side. And then we say, well, can we come up with a solution? It's a bit more involved in that, but essentially that's it. My side, your side, come up with a solution. Because the alternative is to repeat the same cycles. And, it, you know, some people just do it one time through and they're like, yeah, let's solve the problem. That's great for them. Some people it's 10 times. Some people it's 20 times. It doesn't matter. Like there's no award for how many times you have to go through the same thing to say, okay, no, it stops now. It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's a process. So I'm hearing we said you need bravery, you need courage, and you also need patience, right? Yeah. And many times I feel like you would need support for this. So yeah. where can people find you um, to continue, you know, diving deep into breaking cycles and be able to find you? yeah it's funny because as soon as you see the cycles in one place you start to see it everywhere and then you become me and it's like inception <laughs> and they're everywhere it's great um yeah so I I have I'm um, my biggest thing I always bring people to is I have a Facebook group because I like to pop in <laughs> and um it, because it's called so it's called um the cycle breaker parents unite because it's all of us there for all different ways all different reasons that we're coming in and <coughs> sorry and I feel like for somebody to click join on that group, is it somebody saying, I'm a cycle breaker parent. I want to join with other ones. And that's why I show up there all the time. I do you know, free workshops. I do, in fact, I've got one coming up in, in a couple of weeks and I offer resources. There's a whole load of conversation. So that's why I always invite people to come and join us in the Facebook group. Perfect. And we'll uh, link I that in the show notes. Ah, oh, thank you. It's so great because every everybody is welcome. You know, whether you had a really, really tough, challenging upbringing, you know, we we're saying at the start, whether you had a really tough upbringing or whether you had like a pretty nice upbringing and there were just, you know, but that little thing, but that little thing, 
or and some people are in that group because they had a tough time through covid and yeah everybody if you didn't want to home educate you know if you're like the, the whole schooling at home whilst working and relationships got frayed that's a cycle and they're saying i want to break that now i want it to be a bubble of yes it's tough and now i want us to move out of it that's a cycle too so you know everybody's welcome everybody awesome so before we finish um i would love to ask you five questions that i ask all my guests <laughs> Um, because I like, you know, we like to hear from different moms. So the first question is, what is one of your favorite things about being a mom? Hugs. It's a hug. In fact, uh, I can I can show you because we, you know, we're recording this face to face. I have a tattoo, oxytocin. It's the, um, the chemical structure. And like, I mean, especially because mine is mine are young, but I have goals that we will always be like hugging and, and looking at, you know, even when they're teenagers and older, this is this is what I want. And that's my version of breaking cycles. The oxytocin hit is just so wonderful. It's so magical. And uh, we are a very, very huggy family. And, you know, I will literally, I will wake up and be climbed on. And, you know, some days I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> but mostly 99.9% of the time, it's like, oh, I woke up with a hug. And, you know, it's just wonderful. And you I can't think be it's important hugs to on tap. If we're talking about cycles, did you grow up in a huggy family? Oh, no. 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 And that is something I think that sometimes people are so sure that you can't change. Like, I'm just not a touchy person. Yeah. I can't, I, you know, I was brought up like that and it could change. So I it can change. Well, you get, to, you get to choose. I always say you have so much more power than you know. Yeah. And as the parents, we are leaders in our family. If we change that to, oh, I'm a parent, I'm just struggling and doing it. If we change that to, I'm a leader in my family, that's totally different, isn't it? And we get to say, actually, I want us to be a huggy family because it's important and it makes us all feel closer and it's just lovely yeah. <laughs> and it's got some great stress and, you know, health benefits. Let's be a huggy family. And all you need to do is say, hey, kids, you want a hug? And they will. And it might Almost feel artificial in the beginning. It yeah. might feel, I, you know, I had a conversation with a client who she felt the same thing about her spouse. She felt that it was very hard for her to be touchy with her spouse and it didn't feel real. And she said after a process, she said in the beginning, it was so artificial and I didn't feel like it was me, but now I can't wake up without a hug. Like now it's who I am. So yeah, you could definitely change that. Okay. What's your most challenging thing about parenting? Or not most, one of them. <laughs> one of them. Uh, tiredness. For me, honestly, it's tiredness. Um, because because we had three kids in three years, there just wasn't any sleep. And and they're still, you know, they, we co-sleep with the, the boys. It's funny because our daughter, like, really, uh, before she was one, she was like, yeah, no, no, I'm done. I want my own room. And off she went. You know, she was happy. She was actually, and she still is happier in her own bed, mostly. Uh, she does sometimes come in in the middle of the night. Um and so the yeah we we toss and turn in the night the boys need lots of cuddles in the night one of my middle child has some you know extra needs and he's very sensitive like highly sensitive and so I wake up a lot <laughs> and and it, it took a lot for me to realize I, I fought it a lot like oh I have to I have to keep doing the same things I have to do what everybody else does you know like comparisonitis I have to do what everybody else does even though I'm really tired and then I I don't know I think actually it was that, you know, 2020 period where the world changed. And I was like, I am tired. How about if I just honoured that and had a quick nap? And then, you know, in the afternoons, even now, if uh, my husband was at home then because it, COVID times. And, and I got into the habit of having like a little nap in the afternoon. And actually, if I had been functioning off four hours sleep, a nap made me able to be a better parent and feel happier and you know support them with their needs and me with my needs and get you know stuff like dinner and wash it you know household stuff done much more happily for half an hour and now in the afternoon we basically we all have downtime and I'll put something on tv with no regrets no guilt whatsoever I will have a half an hour snooze and they know now just let mommy have a snooze or look out the window or whatever or read a book and then I'm back up to it and so when I embraced the tiredness it got a lot easier <laughs> But still, the tired, yeah, the tiredness is, is challenging because we can't think the same way <laughs> when we're tired. I'm going to try and embrace that, too. <laughs> I'm at that stage. <laughs> um, yeah, the hugs and in your hugs. <laughs> uh, OK, if you went on a one week retreat to a deserted island, which might not be far from where you are right now, <laughs> 
Well, yeah, what, not what, my own. <laughs> <laughs> what would you bring with you? Oh, I thought about this. Um, <laughs> okay, I, I can I have two? Is yeah, that okay? I'll give you two. I'll give you two. <laughs> I thought like the practical person in me, it would be you know like a flick knife or or like a Swiss Army knife. You know that's the practical because I know that you need to do lots of stuff to look after yourself things and. Um, also, I could turn it into a crafty thing. I thought a lot about this. You know, I could do some like whittling with the coconut palms and things um, and a pillow. <laughs> you could tell like the, the sleep is really important to me, the quality of sleep. I am very fastidious about pillows. Like I can't, can't do feather pillows. I can't do squashy pillows. I can't do hard pillows. And, and like even when we go and we stay like in a hotel, I take a pillow even mm. now. <laughs> My mom so I, I would too. Yeah, I know it's really strange. Okay. I don't know why, but I'm braced. It's a thing about me. A pillow's a good one. I like that. All right. How about an embarrassing mommy moment? Oh gosh. There are so many. Um <laughs> one of one of my favorite. Oh <laughs> it makes me cringe now. Um so uh yeah, we flew <coughs> from the UK to Vietnam in August 2020 you know at the height of the pandemic and it was you know more very scary we were actually in the UK at that point was in full lockdown you're only allowed out for an hour and you know there's us on the first plane that was allowed into Vietnam and everyone's you know freaking out and 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 you know it was the the start of all like the masks and the gloves and all that we're going on a long haul flight first time we've been on a flight with our children like, okay we could do this we could do this and um so we're in the, we're in the line at Heathrow airport with all of this stress and tension and and we turned around whilst we were waiting for our bags to be you know queuing up to have our bags cut on plane and we turned around, two of our children were lying on the floor at Heathrow airport licking the floor <laughs> and, and um and actually one of them he still does lick the floor and he licks cuddles and things and it's just I don't know it's just how he is it's fine and <laughs> and you could just see all the other people like all the people who were on the plane were like what <laughs> and then they, the Heathrow officials were like oh my god make it stop make it stop and we we're like yeah that's our kids <laughs> <laughs> that I, I like that story yeah I can relate to licking things that when places where people yeah. do not approve <laughs> yeah and rails the lift like elevated doors why Why? (laughs) Uh, awesome okay last question so (laughs) if you could give a tip to yourself before becoming a mom for yourself as a mom what would it be it's a big one um I thought about this long and hard and actually I think that it would be to say okay understand before you go in that you can feel privileged and honored and so happy with your life and the fact that you were a parent and dislike some things that like you don't have to like you don't have to like wiping bums you don't have to like abject tiredness you don't have to love the fact because I don't love the house at my house is always a mess and that's fine and it's still going to be a mess and I can still embrace it and just because at first I felt really guilty like you know, the mom guilt it's just endless isn't it and even when you're aware of it and you're courageously compassionately curious and all that it's still I could be like oh you know I'm finding this really hard I'm really upset and because, <laughs> because of the ages of my children it's often like nappy 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 or it was for a while you know nappy 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 sick 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 washing machine washing machine washing machine and I remember doing things like I'm really miserable and it, but the thing is, like, some things are going to make you miserable. You know, your child having a meltdown in the park, you don't have to enjoy it. You don't have to. Because, and it doesn't mean that you're ungrateful and it doesn't mean that you're disrespectful and it doesn't mean that you're not a good mom. It's just embracing all of it and knowing that you don't have to love every microsecond. You know, when people say, love every second of it because they grow. And then you feel guilty because you didn't like that time when your kid pooed on you (laughs) you don't have to like it but you can you can acknowledge that I'm privileged and I love this and I'm happy and honored and I didn't enjoy scrubbing the floor right that time (laughs) thank you so much that's like a permission slip for me and for everyone listening (laughs) and I feel like the underlying message (laughs) that I'm hearing and I'm sure that I mean there are many more is just really an empowerment to choose and to choose what kind of mother you want to be, what kind of wife you want to be, what kind of woman you want to be. 
And thank you so, so much for coming on and bringing your wisdom to us today. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Mama, and thanks for joining us and listening to this episode. I know what it's like to crave some together time with your husband, but feel so stuck because for whatever reason, you can't leave the house. Maybe someone's sick, maybe there's no babysitter budget, or maybe you're just too exhausted. Well, that's why I would love to gift you a list of 50 date night ideas that you can do at home when you can't find a babysitter. It doesn't mean date night is doomed. Go over to alizasaid.com, that's A-L-I-Z-A-S-A-I-D.com, slash 50 date night ideas, and download a list of awesome ideas for a date night at home. Plus, you get some really essential guidelines to make a home date awesome, some important things that can either make it or break it. So head over to alizasaid.com, slash 50 date night ideas, and date away.